Well, welcome back to those who are coming uh, back in to join us for our third panel. I'm just going to hang back for an extra minute or so until the number of participants number uh, that I have in front of me sort of stabilizes. There's still people coming in at this point. So I'll just hold back for another <coughs> 60 seconds or so. Okay, well, uh, let's start. I trust everyone had a, a, a good lunch. Um, uh, let me welcome now panel three, uh, fighting the Franco-Prussian War. We've got um, uh, three papers lined up uh, by Mark Hewitson, uh, Armel de Roux, uh, Professor Olivier Foucard, um, and uh, it'll be uh, 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 Armel will be both presenting a paper, um, but also sharing this session. So he's got the advantage of timing himself. Um, so we've got uh, one and a half hours. Um, so there'll be plenty of time, hopefully, for questions and answers at the end. Just to remind everyone, of course, that these sessions, these panels are uh, being recorded. Uh, so Armel, over to you. Thank you, Michael. Good afternoon. It is a huge pleasure to approach this colloquium this afternoon, even though 2 p.m. is rarely the best time to catch public attention. Nevertheless, I'm sure everyone will be captivated by our panelists right now. Or if some of you are going to dive in a deep reflection um, after lunch, all messages we, that will be delivered will inspire your subconsciousness. In this room table, uh, we will deal with warfare, violence, and political objectives during the franco prussian War. For that, let me introduce uh, you, you, our lecturers. I'm honored to welcome Professor Mark Hewitson, who is a professor of German history and politics at University College London. His most recent books are Germany and the Modern World, 1880-1914 at Cambridge, Absolute War, Violence and Mass Warfare in the German Lands, and The People's War, Histories of Violence in the German Lands. Professor, you will speak on cultures of violence in the franco prussian War. Afterwards, we will have the pleasure to listen to Professor Olivier Forcad, with whom I have a special link because he was my first professor of international relations uh, when I was cadet at the Military Academy uh, a long time ago. And then, and then my PhD director at Paris Sorbonne University, where I teach in contemporary history and international relations. Specialized on the history of intelligence, he's going to deal with, with a topic applied to this conflict. Director of Sorbonne University Press, he published many books, albeit in French, L'engagement des Américains dans la guerre. 1917-1918, dans le secret du pouvoir, l'approche française du renseignement du XVIIe au XVIIIe siècle, la République secrète, histoire des services spéciaux de 1918 à 1939. Finally, uh, I will conclude or I, I will speak between these two uh, uh, lecturers and I will, uh, I will deal with the um, consequences of, on this conflict on the current French political structures. Professor Marc, your speech examines 
what is meant by cultures of violence before going on to assess the impact of violence on German conscript in 1870, 1871. It is based on a reading of correspondence, diaries and memoirs. The floor is yours. Thank you. A kind introduction. I feel that someone should do your introduction, but unfortunately I'm not prepared. <laughs> I'm going to share my screen now, hopefully. Okay. I'd like to talk uh, uh, today about cultures of violence during the Franco-German War. Um, what do we mean by the term cultures of violence and why should we be interested in them? The term culture itself, of course, is contested, but its use in this context, I think, derives from two sources principally. First, a distinction made above all in studies of the Second World War between primary group loyalty situational factors, including uh, physical conditions, the effects of technology and institutional constraints on action, typically within armies, and culture in a broad sense, which is held to explain soldiers' attitudes and their way of waging war, from Victor Davis Hansen's claim that there's a Western way of waging war, extending back 2,500 years uh, to ancient Greece, and based on evolving forms of civic militarism, to John Lynn's investigation of battles between antiquity and the present, culminating in a chapter on terrorism, which shows how reactions to combat have altered in accordance with changing cultural expectations. Second, there's been a connected debate stimulated by George Moss's investigation of the brutalizing effects of war on combatants and civilians about la culture de guerre during the First World War. Stefan Audouin Rousseau and Annette Becker in particular posited that war cultures in each combatant country connected those on the fighting front with those on the home front. War culture or culture de guerre, write Joe Winter and Antoine Prost, is a term alluding to the mental furniture men and women draw on to make sense of their world at war, seeping into every aspect of domestic life and constituting what George Orwell was to call the moral pollution of war. For Rodwan Rousseau especially, this pollution included changing attitudes to violence. These historians of war, including contributors to Gerhard Hirschfeld, Gerd Krummeich, and Irina Renzer's Keine Food sich hier mehr als Mensch from 1993, and Hirschfeld and others, uh, Kriegserfahrungen from 1997, have generally come to agree uh, that there are overlapping cultures of war corresponding to different urban, rural, regional, confessional, class, and gender based milieu. Here, I'd like to link these two sets of claims to a third set, um, which is more closely aligned with citizens' attitudes in the 19th century, and which derives from research into the American Civil War. The question is, given the nature of mass warfare from the Revolutionary Wars onwards, and given the advent of modern warfare with the introduction of new types of weaponry after the 1850s, why did conscripts and civilians go to war with so little opposition or resistance? Why did they carry on fighting? And what was the long-term impact of their participation in military conflicts? In my opinion, it's worth asking whether something analogous to Michael Barton's notion of character or Gerald Lindemann's concept of courage played a part, where a constellation of values, including uh, those of duty, honor, godliness, chivalry, and masculinity, initially permitted courageous acts, or I quote, her heroic action, undertaken without fear, at least on the part of educated middle-class volunteers. For such men and for others, how important was the cause for which they were fighting and what did it consist of? This is a question considered by James McPherson amongst many others. Did the causes for which soldiers fought continue to motivate them until the end of the conflict or were they replaced by varying phases of disillusionment as troops were worn down by the firepower of breech-loading rifles and the randomness of death resulting from the exploding shells of distant artillery. The evaluation of the longer term effects of such combat has proved more difficult than for, the, for that of 20th or in even early 21st century conflicts for which more evidence exists, including of course, extensive psychiatric records. All of these questions and difficulties apply to the 19th century wars in which German soldiers participated 
in an addition, sorry, in addition to an assessment of the conditions of war itself, which as Mark Neely Jr. has pointed out, remain contested, they entail the investigation of experiences, emotions, psychological impact, memory, history, autobiography, writing, visual representation and public debate, which affected citizens' willingness to go to war and to wage it, in other words, to keep on fighting and their memories of the conflict on which their willingness to wedge the next war depended. How did war fit into the broader spheres of foreign and domestic policy? In this talk, I'd like to address the question why soldiers continued to fight, even after the conditions which they faced proved unexpectedly grueling. Franco-German war, of course, um, was bloody. According to Adam Buchholz, there'd been 1,600 Prussian casualties and 8,000 Danish ones in the Schleswig War in 1864, 9,000 Prussian dead and wounded, and 44,000 Austrian casualties in the Austro-Prussian War in 1866, and 116,696 Prussian losses, that's to say dead and wounded, uh, in the Franco-German War in 1870 to 71. Unlike in 1864 and 1866, the weaponry, tactics, and training of the German army's opponent were as effective, or could be as effective, given the good decision-making, as their own, leading to higher German losses. At Spickeren on the 6th of August, uh, which involved the First Army, and in which more than two Prussians and Hanoverians died for every French casualty or were injured, the 4,500 uh, German casualties to 2,000 French, and a similar number of dead and wounded at Wert or Flushwiller, in, uh, in which the Third Army was engaged on the same day, 11,000 French casualties compared to 10,500 Germans. And of course, at Mars Latour and Gravelotte on the 16th and 18th of August, um, in which roughly 35,000 were killed or wounded on each side. Some soldiers who'd served in 1866 were already fearful of what was to come in 1870. An educated ordinary soldier like the Bavarian Florian Kuhnhauser, for example, who'd been in Vienna in July 1870 and fought on Austria's side four years earlier with a Bavarian unit, um, went to France with mixed feelings of trepidation and enthusiasm. Within me, a great struggle was going on, for I knew all too well from 1866 what it means to go to war, and now against such a powerful, feared opponent, he recalled. For someone who was not a career soldier, this is certainly excusable. The thought of being torn away again from my profession and from business, and have to leave Vienna, which had become so dear to me, had a depressing effect on my spirit. By the 6th of August, he was in France, rousing himself after spending the night outside in the rain. I shall never forget uh, this first night in France, he wrote, hungry, soaked to the skin, and covered in excrement and dirt. There's every indication that German troops went off to war with a mixture of different feelings, including the foreboding or reluctance of their parents, particularly in farming communities, a general acceptance of mobilization, hopes of heroism or adventure, and a belief in the defensive national character of the conflict against France. But they then encountered unexpectedly nauseating and disorienting conditions of combat. There are many examples of testimony, both published and unpublished, including samples of the 89,659,000 letters delivered by the Postal Service of the North German Confederation between the 16th of July, 1870 and the 31st of March, 1871, plus the 11 million or so letters uh, carried by the South German Postal Services. They range from the contemporaneous experiences or erlebnisse of middle-class one-year volunteers, such as Edmund Metsch, who was a trainee teacher from Bavaria, to the letters of barely literate villagers, such as Gerhard Becker from the Rhineland, who blamed the paper. You'll not be angry that the paper is so bad, he wrote, for his poor handwriting, but could find no excuse for his complete lack of grammar. He wrote without commas, full stops, or any other punctuation. For middle-class volunteers like Metsch, Patriotic pride was frequently intermixed with fear of and disgust at the sights and smells of combat. His first glimpse of war was the battlefield of Wissenburg shortly after the fighting had taken place on the 4th of August. 
the view of which will always remain fresh in my memory my whole life long, he wrote. Germans and French, who were reconciled by the unswayable angel of death, lay peacefully beside one another, and the sight of them cut deep into my heart. So many had said in their noble, holy enthusiasm, yes, I want to die for my fatherland. But here, in view of those who sacrificed their lives on the altar of the fatherland a few hours ago, such enthusiasm would disappear from many. Before leaving this book, Metcher's regiment had rested near the village, which he had decided to walk around, coming across 11 dead in a row in a vegetable garden. Their gaping wounds, he wrote, visible to my eye. No mourning heart cried over their corpses. No thankful or loving hand closed the eyes of these brave ones. No warm prayer climbed up from their coffins to heaven. Lonely, unknown, and unmourned, they lay on foreign soil, far from their high mat and their loved ones. At the same time, I was brave like a man and called to mind the holy affair for which I was standing in the field. I said to myself that I would go to fight uh, for the home of my loved ones and for my dear beloved fatherland. At the Battle of Vert on the 6th of August, such feelings evaporated. The air was full of smoke and torn apart by millions of bullets. It was turmoil, as if the elements of the earth were going to split apart. I was able to watch this for a few minutes. Then we went into the pandemonium against the enemy. Bullets surrounded us like swarming insects, and only the cracking of hit trees and the collapsing of so many vital, healthy comrades showed how these insects were different from another, sorry, showed that these insects were from another realm of nature. Branches fell down, cracking, and poor wounded soldiers twisted around, sighing, groaning, and pleading for help, wallowing in their own blood. By 7 p.m., the battle was over, won gloriously, as he put it. However, many had paid with life, health, and limbs. The sights on the field where they rested were horrific. One soldier had his foot blown off, left hanging by threads of nerves. Another had had the right side of his face torn away from his eye to his chin. To see such a terrifying picture banished the drunkenness of victory for the most part and had a shaming effect as soldiers became conscious that humans had done all this, recalled Kuhnhauser of the day after the battle. Rank and file uh, troops, usually from rural or working class communities, were rarely tempted to dramatize their plight in this way. Even after fighting, many were stoical and taciturn, with Heinrich Becker's postcard home after the Battle of Clavelot on the 18th of August. Typical, God did not abandon us, but many a comrade is no longer there. The majority, however, were moved by what they'd experienced to write at greater length. Johann Hohn had fought on the 18th from 4 a.m. to 9 p.m. I thank God that I remained without injury under a rain of bullets and grenades, he confessed to his father. When we go to battle again is not known to us. God may give his blessing to each. As he watched the wounded being brought in by stretcher, he found it indescribable. I would have much more to write, but unfortunately for this, one has no rest. Johann Kochen described the grenades which exploded above us and flew around and over us like doves, obliging his comrades to hide behind a wall. He'd been wounded above the eye in the fighting, but remained on the field until 10 p.m., pushing back the French with many losses. Similarly, Ferdinand Wallmann, who'd already witnessed terrible fire before the Battle of Gravelot, gave a fuller franker report of the fighting on the 18th. Yesterday, a great battle was again waged, and we were under terrible grenade fire for seven hours in a wood. Underlining the horror of the fighting, he counted the shells, at least 200 grenades, before clamming up. I cannot describe this terrible thing for you. He was hit, but not badly wounded. Many comrades have gone, he concluded. On the 24th, he repeated the same words. I cannot know right for you everything terrible. The battle lasted into the night. How many prayers of thanks climbed up to the heavens that evening, asked Friedrich Schoeffer in his diary. His own company had lost 107 dead and wounded more than half of the total. As they'd marched into battle on the 16th, the first already lay there dead and wounded before the last had entered the fray. The reaper had a rich harvest here. It seemed as if the entire French army had trained its guns on us. When the commander gave a speech amidst the debris of the regiment, tears rolled from our eyes. Schaefer was proud of his company's achievement, but he also longed for a quick end to the war. 
His sentiment stood in stark contrast to his earlier bravado as he joyfully answered yes to the prospect of enlistment. It's hard to be sure how profound and long lasting these impressions of combat were. Priests were the main embedded witnesses. Admittedly, they approached the conflict with a complicated superstructure of moral and patriotic expectations, but many agreed with Edmund Fleiderer that wartime conditions and norms diverged from those of peacetime. There's no question that a life like that of the campaign could not leave people as they are in their habitual and ordered circumstances, he wrote. Everything became more extreme, with a steady alternation of security and danger having an enervating impact propelling one's entire physical and psychic life into a torpor and rage, into a rapid, irregular torrent. One has no conception of the disorder of war if one has not seen it with one's own eyes, wrote the Catholic chaplain Gottlob Dettinger, and these days were just as shocking for one's morale. A single day of battle brought mass suffering, awful pain, an indescribable misery for hundreds of thousands, went on Dettinger, as the most terrifying spectacle was left behind the front of a relentlessly advancing army, thankfully unseen by most soldiers. The wounded seemed to really relive the terrors of their last hours in wild, febrile fantasy. Some who made their way to field hospitals were a horrible sight. The most terrifying which we saw like this, of which there were not a few, had had his whole face shot away. The nose was fully gone, in the place of his eyes, one could see thick, yellow, festering areas in the hollows of the bone, and in the entire mass of flesh, the countenance of a human could no longer be recognized. I've given instances of these sorts of testimony because I think it's difficult to um, uh, realize just how explicit uh, they were. And they, the, their explicitness contrasts, I think, very markedly with the coverage in the, in the press at the time. What were the effects of such experiences and how were they related to longer lasting memories of war? It's hard to gauge the long-term impact of conscript soldiers' exposure to violence. The volume of the official medical report, the Sanitätsbericht, that examined war psychoses was published in 1885 and listed only 316 cases from the 1.5 million men mobilized. The report's conclusion noted, and I quote, a moderate increase of the mentally ill during the duration of wartime activities. Yet this was the first ever inquiry in Germany into the psychiatric effects of warfare, and the army had not employed psychiatrists during the war itself. Although the report shows that there was no overall increase over the longer term of those treated for psychosis, it also reveals that there was no means for such treatment to take place during wartime. What we've instead is hundreds of contemporaneous and many retrospective ego documents, which state that combatants were deeply affected by what they'd experienced. I argue that soldiers' experiences of violence altered the ways in which war was perceived. It's true, of course, that the patriotic mythology of the Franco-German war was established during the conflict and became an orthodoxy after 1871, linked to a widespread belief in Germany that the Bonapartist regime had provoked the conflict, that this justifiable war had been borne by the German people in its entirety, and that the war gave rise to unification. Yet there are indications that the mass experience of violence in 1870 to 71, which existed in different forms and was added to similar but smaller scale exposures to violence in 1864 and 66, transformed many citizens' conceptions of, of conflict. This transformation was not largely a matter of the changing conditions of warfare. During the previous period of mass warfare in 1805 to 15, the majority of German troops had faced similar conditions, albeit with variations, but with also higher mortality rates, yet few soldiers wrote of their suffering. The same effect was not discernible in the decades after the Franco-German War, when reports and recollections of fears, revulsion and mourning were openly articulated alongside a dominant narrative about an historic patriotic struggle. This subtext, which corresponded to the emotional responses of a broad cross-section of troops, played a part in veterans' private memories and subjects' public discussions of the military and of war during the imperial era. 
It did not prevent, of course, warmongering within the army and in extra parliamentary leagues, most famously by Kolmar von der Goltz, whose book Das Volk in Waffen in 1883 urged Germans, and I quote, to work incessantly towards a final struggle for the existence and greatness of Germany. Instead, fears and hopes of war were added to the cornucopia of other ambitions and anxieties which comprised the political life of the Kaiserreich. It left in place Janus-faced images of warfare, deriving above all from the intimate and unstable connections between national myth-making and veterans' own darker sets of recollections of the wars of unification. Like Moltke in 1890, many citizens appear to have found it impossible to banish the spectre of an unlimited war threatening civilization and costing hundreds of thousands of human lives. By 1914, the remaining veterans of the wars of unification were old men, their voices largely drowned out by generations who had no experience of military conflict. Some of the succeeding generations evidently regretted that they'd missed their opportunity to participate in a glorious war. Many others, though, were less enthusiastic. The previously belligerent national liberal Eugen Schiffer was not alone in noting, and I quote, the deadening seriousness which has settled down on the people during the July crisis of 1914. Our people had heavy hearts, wrote Theodor Wolf, the left liberal editor of the Berliner Tageblatt in 1916. The possibility of war was a frightening giant nightmare which caused as many sleepless nights. There were many reasons for mass opposition to and quiet doubts about the outbreak of hostilities in 1914 ranging from anti-militarism within sections of the SPD to a concern amongst individual newspaper readers that the slaughter of the Russo-Japanese and Balkan wars would be repeated on a much larger scale. One important reason for doubts about the conflict, perhaps the principal underlying one, was the persistence of ambivalence about the prospects of a future war dating back to the 1860s. Arguably, this was the main legacy of German cultures of violence in 1870 to 71. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Mark, um, for your very insightful speech on the evolution of the battle effects on soldiers and populace. Okay. Uh, and it reminded me a conference I took part in uh, in 2014 at Gravelot Museum when a lecturer uh, spoke on uh, ordinary, uh, ordinary uh, violence, and I blew up, and uh, because I strongly disagreed with him, uh, because I, I believe that violence is not, and is never ordinary. Uh, above all, if you have already experienced it, and uh, everything you, 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 you dealt with uh, during this speech reminded me some, uh, operational experience I had, and uh, I, I, I deeply agree with your analysis. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, instead of speaking right now, I will let the floor to Olivier Forcade, uh, because we have been a bit longer than uh, scheduled. And Olivier, if you have to speak a bit longer too, I prefer to reduce my speech. Please <laughs> Olivier, the floor is yours. Olivier? Olivier, do you read me? Do you hear me? Do okay. you hear me? Hey, yeah, hey. okay. Go ahead. Thank you very much, my Colonel Dear Armel, uh, for your welcoming. Uh, I'm sure you are a very, very good German. You are, of course, uh, an excellent friend. You was a, an excellent student. You are an excellent officer uh, and now German. So th thank you very much. But 20 minutes uh, for me, too, of course. On August 1870, uh, the attack of, on Saarbrücken marked the start of Franco-Prussian war operations. A month later to the day, the French army was defeated and Napoleon III capitulated at Sedan. Uh, my supposition is that intelligence is probably the French missing dimension uh, at this time. So we would like to examine successively three dimensions. First, the strategic intelligence and the diplomacy of Napoleon III and his military and political chiefs. 
then the intelligence at the operative scale, uh, and finally, uh, and partly the tactical intelligence, uh, in particular uh, from human sources. So first, some consideration on strategic intelligence about the, the Franco-Prussian war. At first, we have to consider the aim of the French diplomatic policy in France uh, uh, and uh, in Prussia. Let us first project a new understanding of the French and Prussian intelligence processes in two states with very different civil and military institutions. With the aim of informing Napoleon III and Bismarck, intelligence of military interest is defined here as the sum of military intelligence and environmental intelligence in a political and diplomatic sense. The aim is to inform the military and political leaders. It's also necessary to situate the only military events in the past strategic and diplomatic decade. In particular, the victorious Prussian phase uh, on the summer of 1870 must be replaced and understood within the framework of the Deutschen Einigungskriegen, as the German unification was, as you know, uh, between, um, from, from the invasion of Schleswig-Holstein and reinforced by the victory Prussian on Austria in Sadova in 1866. So strategic intelligence is reinforced and implemented over the long term of several years of foreign policy and military policy. However, this goal of France's foreign policy by calling into question the principles of European equilibrium led Napoleon III to increase its foreign expeditions. So two remarks. First remarks. There is a Prussian political war goal with the, with, which is the unification of the German states by Prussia. France's goal is to oppose this German project by relying on the southern German states, first Bavaria, then Saar, Palatina, as Thuringia. But it will squander this goal of defense in the eyes of the European allies by falling into the trap of the Ems dispatch. For me, it's perhaps Bismarck's masterpiece of intoxication. When war was declared, France found itself without an ally. On July, however, during the Council of Ministers, the Duke of Gramont, Minister of Foreign Affairs, assured that France could count on its allies. So what happened? Uh, one explanation is the position of uh, the Russia, the role of Alexander Gorchakov, um, Minister of Foreign Affairs in Russia, is now known uh, with the study of Stephanie Burgo. His thesis demonstrates to us the place of Russia in Bismarckian geopolitics, Russian neutrality with Prussia is due to the policy of European aggression since the Crimean War, giving force to Prussian Russian cooperation to malicious Russian neutrality in 1864-66. Its purpose is to prevent a Prussian French alliance to have the support of Berlin to revise the Treaty of Paris of 1856 and to make uh, to, uh, it in a conservative barrier against revolutionary movements, thus allowing Bismarck to pursue his goal towards the unity of Germany. My second remark uh, for um, supposing that France squanders the four factors of strategic intelligence. Um, for what of having clearly defined the political criteria of what would be the enemy's defeat, it does not know how to 
access German military and logistical resources as a state of forces of the European partners. In particular, diplomatic information established that the mobilizations of the Austrian and Italian armed forces would exceed by several weeks the French mobilization that Napoleon wanted to achieve uh, into the three weeks, two or three weeks. So Napoleon III will fight to gather resources to win the war. First, demographic resources uh, with the mobilization and a concentration of troops lower than the forecast of the Minister of War, Joseph Trandon, then General Leboeuf after uh, 1868. The difficulties of mobilizing the French armies and first of all logistics, which mark the divisions of the old army, the sanctities of unenthusiastic countries, ardent merchants, volunteers, attentive to their promotion, reservists, recruits from 1869 and the Defense Army National Network set up by Gambetta at last. So it was the first, the first mistake. Second, economic resources to equip its troops. Many of these soldiers uh, have a lack of uniforms and armaments when they were and divided at the end of August. In comparison with the disordered forces of the reserve, the rapidly operational colonial troops went against the image and proved to be of great operational value, including symbolically in the battles of Baze at the end of August uh, 1870. Third, third aspect, it's the logistic resources with an underestimation of the importance of the railway means of transport of troops to lead concentration. It's very important and fundamental to move its forces in a strategic maneuver. If a central railway commission was indeed created on March 1869, the mobilization will stumble in 1870 on the rail logistics issues of the concentration of French forces and their working. Napoleon remains the principle of Napoleon Bonaparte, get involved and see. Maybe it was late. Composed of general officers and representatives of the railway companies, this railway commission was to consider the question of the transport of troops by rail, but not plan for the employment of the railways in what time could be established, finally. So, second part, the operative level of intelligence uh, before and at the beginning of the military operations. This is a very important operational level of uh, intelligence. This operational level uh, aims to design the maneuver, which is limited on continental and maritime dimensions at the beginning of the war, uh, of course. In this, in this way, we have to consider uh, many aspects. Uh, first is the planning in order to establish a geometry of the field and the maneuver. You have to consider the setting of priorities to be shared with the components to be supported and supporting. Then the search for rhythm in operations to take the initiative on the adversary action and reaction. And you have to consider the distribution of efforts and resources uh, as intensity of your effort. 
during the campaigns of Crema, Italy and Mexico, no plan of campaign have been rigorously worked out. So Napoleon III had consulted Adolf Thiers and Jomini before entering in campaign in Italy. But the problem was the plan uh, with his general staff. In fact, it seemed that the French military leaders hardly cared about planning. They were relying, relying on the superiority of their troops to beat the, the enemy wherever they encountered them. And we know that General Trochu made his bitter observation after the defeat of 1870 in his famous book, The French Army. He was indeed one of the few officers to worry after the Battle of Sadoa. At first sight, that the French army was unprepared if it were to enter a campaign against the Prussian army. However, the French military attaché in Berlin, Lieutenant Colonel Stoffel, who had been authorized to follow Mort during the campaign against Australia, underlined in his reports the degree of preparation reached by the Prussian army in the field, training, mobilization, and command. In July 1869, he estimated that the forces of the North German Confederation could be mobilized and concentrated on the French border only in three weeks. But he wasn't believed, some even suspecting him of buying in Bismarck pay. Marshal Leboeuf himself, then Minister of War, thought he was exaggerating the danger far too much. And General Ducot, who had been in command in the 6th Strasbourg Division since 1865, also increased his warnings about the threat posed by Prussia. In 1868, he wrote, we must not hide in from ourselves our preparation compared to that of Prussia is not good. And the day the struggle begins, our forces will be those of our adversaries in the proportion of one to three. So in spite of the lessons of Sadova in 1866 and of Luxembourg uh, one year later, the political project of a vast military reform announced in 1866 by Napoleon was abandoned. This reform don't exist. However, Napoleon had been able to learn the lessons of the rectories against Russia in 1856 and against East Italy in 1859, despite the rise in power of his army, which had only won against armies that were even less well prepared. In May 1867, therefore, in anticipation of a confrontation with Russia, he asked for real operational preparation for Generals Lebrun and Leboeuf, work on the composition of the armies. The two reports were merged into a single document, which was printed in 100 copies under the title of composition of the armies. The emperor, taking inspiration from Frossard's ideas, has decided that in the event of war, the French army would be divided into three armies. This question is, is well known, uh, you know it. So Bismarck obtained with uh, his uh, human agents in Paris, 
uh, this document, the composition of the armies. In the French military and political tradition of the offensive, Napoleon remained attached to his plan with an excessive optimism, not shared by his generals, who nevertheless executed it. As expected, the mobilization and concentration operation were carried out simultaneously. The order of movement by Rai launched by Lebeuf uh, at mid-July with confusion. So I would like to, to finish with the third remark about the operal, operational level of intelligence uh, with the question of human sources uh, by comparison between uh, France and Prussia. Human intelligence is at the heart of the Prussian intelligence system with open sources and staff officers coming to follow the French maneuvers, for example, in Chalon from 1867, continuing the observation by traveling across the country after. First, the case of a young unmarried Zurich resident, Edouard Rahn, under the cover of an owner recruiting agents as human sources of the, German, of the military attaché. Then, Major Alfred Valderze, who arrived in Paris on February 1870, takes the system. Two months later, Tissus was able to report, report elements linking to the French campaign plan, in fact, the complete state drawn up by the emperor and the composition of the army of 1868, including, including Lebrun, had two copies. Valderze also cultivated a relationship with a young officer of the Minister of War, Staff Captain Theodore Jung, who had met at the Palva Salon in April 1870. The latter had published on the crisis in the French army for Gobeta's account in July 1868 in the Revue Politique and Littéraire, signed by this young Republican lawyer, two articles on the military budget and the declarations of Marshal Neil about, about the military crisis in France. In addition, assigned to the war depot, Jung had access to Stoffel's French attaché military in Berlin reports. In the surroundings of Gambetta, who also frequented the Paiva Salon, there were also a Dutch business, businessman, Alexander Mendel, uh, who was a parent of um, Bleichroder. The difference, of, the difference in intelligence gathering with France could not have appeared better. Of course, Stoffel was able to establish a connection with the Bismarck family and also the, with the socialist Wilhelm Lichnecht. However, he only responded in this, to the demands of his constituents, the Minister of War and the Emperor's private secretary, Pietri. Second remark, the Crimean War and Sadova recalled the importance of the war depot in France in conflict planning to spur a re revival of military statistics as strategic intelligence had been called since the First Empire. You know, three, three very important French officers. Uh, one was Polish at first, Victor Tansky, then Colonel Eugène Saget and Staff Colonel Jules Leval was responsible for preparing, planning for a conflict with Russia. Uh, 
This planning is established by the preparation of maps on the German states, resulting from 37 reconnaissance missions carried out by staff officers during the Prince and Summer of 1867 to uh, 69 in the Rhineland and in the Rhine, whether help or order. So we have to consider two clandestine missions mobilizing 27 officers under various covers of tourists, painters, or journalists. Last, last remark. Uh, we could consider that the intelligence gathering process deployed by the Prussians and the French uh, was largely similar foreign affairs and military attaché, for example. With similar collection methods, however, the exploitation of intelligence was quite different in the two countries. In Berlin, the Central Nachrichten Bureau under the Auswärtiges Amt received data concerning political questions, while those concerning the armies fell under the pursuit of Nachrichten Bureau of the Grossen Generalstab. Also created in January 1867, this service was entrusted to Major Brandt. But unlike Stieber, the staff officer was accountable only to the chief of staff, Moltk. And this one would inform the chancellor and possibly the minister of war if necessary. So Bismarck emerged as the primary decision maker for the use of intelligence. His main need was to know when and where the French would attack, thus prompting his intelligence services to use both foresight and open information gathered from September 1867. From this point of view, the manipulation of the mistress of an head of camp, the emperor, and an officer in the office of the French Minister of War is enough to guide Bismarck's decision. Last remarks on the French side, operational management was far from comparable. First, there was no intelligence office within foreign affairs, but so the political directorate ran specialized intelligence missions. The management of this agent was in fact delegated to the heads of delegation according to their goodwill and their appetite. Second, and, and finally, the war depot was never that military espionage service that Ducro, Tansky, or Lowell wanted it. The French autocracy offered only a double polarization, of course but political leadership was shared between the emperor and his advisors, including minister of state and foreign minister. So we can, we can conclude by saying that if we could compare the two systems of intelligence and the two processes, Bismarck make a good utilization of intelligence it, was, it wasn't the case of Napoleon III and his generals. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Olivier. And uh, you stressed very well the importance of intelligence, not only in war, but in preparation of the war, and um, how it is difficult for a country when it is isolated to build an intelligence network. and. Uh, uh, as, um, as, um, as warned uh, General Trochu in 1867 in his famous book, The State of the French Army, in which he stressed the high level of unpreparation of the army uh, for such a conflict. Um, a point that is very important when a country has only one very reliable and well informed source, like it was in Berlin with, his, with its military attache, Colonel Stoffel, as you said. Uh, it is important to believe the message he sent and the analysis he can send 
to the capital because if Paris would have taken into account all the information and analysis sent by Stoffel, perhaps uh, the, it is always easy to, to, to remake the, the war uh, some years later, but uh, the, the difficulties perhaps uh, would have been uh, a bit uh, less uh, harsh for, for the French armies. Now uh, I will uh, I will try to shorten um, my my speech, and when we are dealing with um, uh, with the Franco-Prussian War, we have to consider finally two wars into a single conflict. The first phase um, is the imperial war, uh, and this dynastic war. They were this phase was a dynastic war and corresponded to the canons of the Treaty of Vienna in uh, 1815, restoring limitations to war on land between sovereign European states. Uh, and the second phase is uh, what, what I would say, the Republican, uh, the Republican war um, uh, that was vigorously launched uh, by a new government established after the fall of the empire. Uh, and therefore, uh, the government of national defense was set up to continue the hostilities. Uh, I will try, I will deal first with the paradoxical aspiration of having people in arms uh, because uh, the main aim of, uh, for instance, Gambetta was to restore uh, the Republic, a democratic uh, Republic. And uh, I, will, uh, I will try to, to stress in a, in a second part, uh, Gambetta's fear of civil war and uh, all these uh, aspects uh, influenced after war, uh, the political structure of, uh, of, of France and uh, influenced the, 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 the Fifth Republic, the constitution of the Fifth Republic we still have currently uh, in, in, in my country. Uh, the idea of, um, of arming the people arose at the beginning of August during the imperial phase of the war, when the first concerns about the real effectiveness of the French troops arose. On 9 August 1870, as an opposition uh, MP, Gambetta publicly called for a mass mobilization, considering that France was not only facing the Prussian army, but an armed nation. Finally, as soon as he became Homeland Minister during the Republican phase of the war, Gambetta wanting to generalize the war involved all the nation and mobilized, and mobilized all resources, sent out numerous letters and circulars in which he urged resistance. He said, let every Frenchman receive or take a rifle um, and let him place himself at the disposal of the authorities. The fatherland is in danger. He understood perfectly well what was at stake at the time and fought against the opposition and inertia that were sure to hamper their action. The war that Gambetta decided to pursue, even though the armies were defeated, took on the general dimension. The political and administrative structures of France had to be changed. The spiral of defeat and passivity had to be replaced by one of dynamism and faith in the Republican future of the country. It was therefore important not to limit themselves to transform a civilian into a combatant, a simple armed resistance fighter. Scientists, doctors, and anyone with special skills were also recruited to serve the great national cause. In parallel with this policy, Gambetta reorganized a military structure over which he eventually stood and encouraged the arming of the people to lead a guerrilla war against the invader. To restore hope and instill a sense of pride, the political leader had to find historical legitimacy by recalling France's greatness and its ability to overcome difficulties. In addition to that, the new constituted government was seeking for legitimacy as well. How could a new republic be promoted and people encouraged to fight the enemy? The difficulties for these new leaders 
where to find the best historical and ideological references to remind the greatness of France and her ability to influence the world. Going back to the past, the Second Republic could not be mentioned because its first president, Louis Napoleon Bonaparte, became the recently captured and abdicated emperor. The, late, the latest greatness and glory of France were linked to the first empire's military campaigns, and it was not conceivable to refer this aspired Republican restoration to Napoleon I. This past did not match with Gambetta's political orientation. He could only refer to the fatherland in danger of facing the European monarchies, which were refused for immigrate during the French Revolution. The French Revolution, as Karen Wallet shown that in, in her second slide uh, this morning during her briefing, was the only period that combines the fall of tyranny and the fight against the occupier. The popular mobilization was supposed to provoke the awakening of consciences. Of consciences. Nevertheless, Gambetta was very prudent in reminding the revolutionary period because he did not want at all any assimilation of his Republican project with a tyrannic, um, with a dramatic uh, terror during which thousands of people were murdered. Indeed, the violence of this dark period was stressed by a half million of people jailed and around 40,000 people killed. Gambetta hesitated therefore to reactivate the memory of a period that could provoke the opposite feeling, the opposite feeling, sorry, he was seeking. Therefore, his attitude quickly appeared ambiguous because while exalting the mass uprising, the Republican symbol par excellence, he sought to considerably limit its scope. The action of front tireurs and all irregular units was limited by Gambetta's fear of an overly massive, massive rising. Although he appealed to patriotism and urged his fellow citizens to take up arms, he quickly revealed a strong reluctance to see flourishing throughout the country armed groups whose actions he could not control. On September 26, Gambetta missioned the delegation of Paris to prevent the deployment of the Prussians to limit their possibilities of requisitions, to harass them day and night, always and everywhere. In order to encourage an uprising against the invader, a decision was published on the 28th September concerning the compensation of the frontier. However, the very next day, Gambetta made public a decision that was radically different from what he had been encouraging for almost a month. He decided to incorporate all the regular companies and units of frontier into the regular armies of the Loire and the East. The famous German strategist, Kolmar van der Goltz, an actor and historian of the franco prussian War, believed he could explain Gambetta's about face by military considerations. I said, uh, he wrote, sorry. Gambetta knew his militias well. He knew that he could not immediately demand victory from them. It is to him that belongs the well-known saying, success cannot be improvised. He believed only in the technical superiority of the Prussian army, a superiority that can certainly be defeated if the means are great enough. In other words, Gambetta would have sought a fight from the strong to the strong without seeing that France was no longer capable of it. These analyses do not seem to take into account an essential factor that was the political situation. That was, and I should say, that was the internal political situation in France. The chaos in which the country found itself gave free reign to all kinds of excesses because the radical communist and anarchist currents that had been compressed since 1848 saw an opportunity to raise their heads. The situation in France was therefore favorable to revolutionary expression, and this was what Gambetta feared 
as he wanted at all costs to avoid taking France into civil war. And Quentin de Luyam uh, mentioned some elements about this, uh, this topic this morning during uh, his panel. In a decree on 13 September, is Gambetta is particularly explicit on this subject, recalling that only the state can use armed force and that any offender would be de facto outlawed. He kept in mind that on 7 and 8 August, an, insur an insurrectionary attempt had already taken place in Marseille, in the southern part of France, under the leadership of Gaston Crémieux. This left radical man, close to communist circles, tried in vain to proclaim the Republic and established a revolutionary commune in Marseille. He was, he was arrested and jailed after being sentenced by a martial court, but was released on the night of 4 to 5 September when the empire fell. Resuming his radical activity, he created the Ligue du Midi, which very quickly came into conflict with the government of national defense. Robert Middleton, a British witness and observer of this conflict, described Marseille in September as a troubled area where brigands and intriguers meet. This almost mafia-like den tried to use irregular units and set up as an armed arm legitimized by the right of the sovereign people to defend themselves in the absence of a constituted and democratically elected state. The revolution was on the march there and the fights in the east and the north of France were the pretext to seizing the power in Paris. For his part, Bakunin reappeared in Lyon on 15 September 1870 and with other internationalists set up a committee for the salvation of France, which on 17 September proclaimed the abolition of the state and the constitution of revolutionary communes. Any destabilization or internal disorder would inevitably be detrimental to the action undertaken by the government of national defense against the invader. It was therefore important the revolutionary threat to be neutralized and that order could reign in the French rear. To this end, Gambetta ordered General Cruza, who had come to reinforce the Army of the Loire, to send around 15,000 troops to Lyon to put an end to the agitation that was shaking the town. On, 20, on 28 September, the day the decree on the pair of the frontier was published, as I already mentioned, the revolution failed in Lyon. Gambetta then took a first administrative measure to exercise control over the regular units that he had called for. Thus, by decree of the 29th, I already mentioned too, he placed all the companies of frontier and irregular fighters at the disposal of the Minister of War. Jean-Yves Guillaumar, a French historian, pointed out that during the war, Gambetta was constantly talking about war in excess. At the end of January 1871, he stated that only the breeze of the revolution can save us. But in fact, he was wary of the extreme left, which wanted to combine the war of national defense with civil war as in 1793. As early as for September, a delegation from the international called for a mass uprising. On 7 September, Blanqui published a text on La Patrie en danger, the fatherland in danger, which he dated from 20th Fructidor 78. That is, and this date is very important because not, not by the day, but by the meaning, because he used, Blanqui used the, the calendar created by the French Revolution. The month of October corresponded to the rise in power of the irregular units whose action started to disturb the Prussian rears. Continuing his endeavor to control the units engaged in combat, the Minister of War, that is to say Gambetta, gathered the companies of frontier under the name of Auxiliary Army by decree of 14th of October. <laughs> 
For his part, Molkt never ceased to warn his generals against actions that were conducted on the German rear. He also began to dedicate significant manpower to the security of his logistical supplies. However, the facts confirm Gambetta's fear as the Ligue du Midi in Marseille appeared as a seditious movement. The city of Marseille experienced agitation, which led to the proclamation of a revolutionary commune on 1st November. All kinds of swindlers and political activists lived together. On, no on November the 1st, a sharp opposition broke out within the city, the city council, between moderates and revolu revolutionaries, causing the National Guard and the city guard to clash. A committee, including members of the international, was formed and declared the commune revolutionary. General Cluseret, who had alongside Bakunin participated in the uprising, uprising in the commune of Lyon, joined the Marseille movement after the failure of his attempt at the Rhone insurrection. Gambetta dismissed the prefect Esquiros, who was quite close to the anarchist um, movements, and replaced him with another man, Joseph Jean. This last victim of a failed attempt on his life, the new prefect took the department in hand and reestablished Republican order. These were the beginnings of the commune, and Gambetta feared that the temptations of revolution would discredit the Republican ID. He knew the Marseille protagonists in particular, and he knew all about their revolutionary ideas. In full knowledge of facts, Gambetta therefore made a difficult choice. He preferred to give up an effective method of action to fight the Prussians, rather than risk a political and social conflagration in France that could jeopardize the image of democracy. On 1st November, he issued a circular number 29, in which he announced that any units of front that lacked energy would be dissolved and disarmed. To complete his approach and thus bribe the sources of recruitment of irregular troops, Gambetta took four major decisions. He had a decree issued on 2nd November proclaiming the general mobilization of all able-bodied men aged between 21 and 40, married or widowed with children. Bearing in mind the attack on his prefect on Marseille, Gambetta wanted to guarantee stability in the country. He then went on implementing his renunciation by publishing the decree of 4th November, by which he integrated all irregular units into the army, considerably restricting the freedom of action of the frontier. Finally, and as an extension of his previous actions, he proceeded with a massive surge by decree on 7 November. This act, which was general in scope, definitively sealed his renunciation of using all the regular warfare levers in this war. Without giving any precise indication, he placed at his disposal all the valid human resource to employ it where the government needed it. By this legal constraint, he wanted to guard against any change of direction from an insurrection initially directed against the invader into a revolutionary movement dedicated to the conquest of power. This coherent and rigorous approach is characteristic, characteristic of Gambetta's thinking, which remained faithful to his idea of self, safeguarding the Republican idea. From 1872, Onwards, Gambetta took part in the annual banquet held in memory of Osh, General Osh, the Republican symbol of the end of the wars of Vendée and of the restored civil peace. Many shared the idea that Paris being blocked, it was necessary that the center of will and action to be carried everywhere. However, Gambetta, the risk, <coughs> sorry. However, for Gambetta, the risk of being defeated by Prussia was perhaps better than that of France devastated in a civil war. Through the war, his obsession was to preserve the credibility of a Republican democracy to avoid any return of royalty. After the war, he never ceased to denounce 
the spirit of violence, which has so often led democracy astray because national sovereignty or the sovereignty of the people cannot be disordered. I will shorten a bit in order to conclude. And I would say uh, Gambetta had an impressive political and strategic long-term vision. The roots of the current French Republic are in his action and determination, joining efforts done by Adolf Thiers, as said Professor Toms this, this morning, but certainly not in those of the Commune de Paris, as a certain political romanticism would have, uh, would have us believe. The far left violence and uprising in May 1871 are the opposite side and willpower of the Republican restoration wished by Gambetta and did not influence the evolution of our three different constitutions. If there was an influence, it was surely on the contrary to make the political system the most stable possible and far from any violent temptation and way of expression. That concludes my briefing. And now uh, I, I read few questions and we will start with Jeff Phillips uh, who asked if he wants to ask his question. I think that must be a technical question. Okay. Is it possible to enlarge the speaker's screen? Is that? <laughs> no, no, no. It, it was another. No, he asked. Um, yeah. Uh, 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 thank, thank you very much. But um, the professor is very kind. They already answered it. <laughs> because I guess you had uh, a question dealing with uh, Prussian artillery, I guess, if I remember well. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, uh, yes, um, the, the question I asked was that, um, uh, how was it, um, in view of the fact that Friedrich Krupp was um, an international uh, arms salesman and was particularly targeting the French army, that they um, uh, were, uh, that the um, French army uh, significantly underestimated uh, what the Prussian artillery were going to get get up to uh, during the war, and that's be, been very kindly answered already by by uh, Professor Focard. Um, Mark, do you want to start the answer? Uh, no, I've got nothing. I, okay. I, I think to add, add to that. I, um, I, I, I believe that the underestimation uh, of um, by French. Uh, by French command was not only in artillery uh, concern, but in all domains. And uh, it is quite surprising that the French command did never took into account the lessons learned from the US civil war and, and its, and its uh, industrial uh, aspect and consequences uh, in terms of uh, massive destruction, um, and the use of railways, for instance. And uh, the, the Germans, the Prussians, uh, learned a lot from the American Civil War, and they were fully prepared to, uh, to send very quickly their troops uh, towards, the front, uh, towards the frontier, the borders, and uh, they were very well prepared in maneuvering in such uh, geographical or topographical environment. In the contrary, uh, the French troops or the, the French command, above all, because the, the French, the, the, the private, the French privates were very, very tough. They, they were they were very good soldiers, but they, they were unfortunately very poorly led, and because their their, their command was too pride and their overseas deployment and colonial experiences, but the war they faced against Prussia was totally different. The warfare was a total warfare. Uh, they did not uh, prepare, they did not learn because they were focused on different warfare in their colonial or uh, overseas deployments. And this is why uh, I, I would explain the, under, the, the, the huge underestimation uh, from the French side um, towards the, the Prussian one. Uh, Maybe could I add, add yeah. to that? Uh, I'm a, 
Um, I mean, from the German side, I, I think uh, commanders were surprised <laughs> uh, uh, about French uh, actions between the 16th and the 18th, why nothing happened on the 17th. Uh, of uh, of August, um, so th there was a there was a shock <laughs> that 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 French commanders hadn't hadn't prosecuted uh, prosecuted the continued the the battle on the on the on the seventeenth. Um, on the on the German side, I, I think obviously there is uh, an emphasis on mobilization and movement. Um, but there's also far too much movement from Molka's point of view. Um, uh, the first army <laughs> moves straight in front of the second army uh, and ignores uh, Molka's uh, order to to desist. Stein, uh, mm. Steinmet just carries on. Um, so there is disorder. And there's certainly uh, lots of lots of uh, poor coordination in the in the German armies uh, too. Uh, in, in defense, uh, and this is exactly the point which um, way back in 1965, Professor Michael Howard wrote across one of my essays about, um, about, the, about the problems of the uh, Prussian army, is that um, the plan was fine, but there was no way that you could not give Steinmetz a command in view of his magnificent performance in the, Aus in the Austro-Prussian war. And so they were lumbered him, with him, and it wasn't until uh, he uh, outright criticised um, the uh, Friedrich Karl at the siege of Metz that mm -hmm. the opportunity arose for him to be sent off to uh, sent off to be governor of Poland. Yeah, no, I agree. Uh, now we have a question from Philip Mead for you, Mark. Uh, oh yeah, uh, this is about um, well. Uh, about descriptions of battle experience. To what extent uh, was there a quality change in the descriptions of personal battle experience in the second half of the 19th century as compared with the Napoleonic Wars? And how did new military technology or increasing literature contribute to that uh, change? Um, there is a, in my view, there is a, a qualitative change. Um, to my knowledge, there's uh, not, if you by textual analysis, you mean, uh, discourse analysis uh, or more formal linguistic analysis. I'm, I'm not aware of uh, useful studies, but virtually everyone working in this field is conducting textual analysis at, at some level. They're looking at and comparing uh, different forms of ego documents, so memoirs, diaries, correspondence uh, over the long period and often in short, in, in, in short periods. Um, uh, from my reading of the uh, these documents from the Revolutionary Wars, <laughs> um, currently reading uh, uh, memoirs of the Weimar years, um, there's a really significant change, which is quite difficult to, to explain. It's not stylistic, uh, in my view. Uh, the, there are literary critics who've argued that there's a largely stylistic <laughs> shift and it, it's about changing sensibilities. Clearly, sensibilities do change, but I think the main impact of changing sensibilities is when conscript soldiers um, uh, engage in engage in battle, and and then their sensibilities are, are affronted in in a in a new way, and they commit this to to paper, um, and the the way in which they do it alters fundamentally. Um, Karen Hageman's got, I think, the best database of memoirs and diaries of the Napoleonic Wars and the Revolutionary Wars, and she's got 146 memoirs and diaries that are published just after the Napoleonic Wars, so in the decades after. Frank Kulik, I think, on the German side, has got the largest collection of similar uh, memoirs and diaries after the um, Wars of Unification, the Franco-German War, just on the Franco-German War, uh, there are 432 memoirs and diaries in his database. Um, and I think this points to a more obvious fact that publishing um, war literature, the expectations uh, of, of, of a public buying that literature have changed fundamentally um, when you compare the 1820s. Uh, and the 1870s and particularly 1890s when a lot, a lot of the memoirs came out. So 
there are changes in the way in which war is portrayed in the press, there are changes in publishing, but I, I still think from looking at these diaries and, uh, and memoirs and comparing memoirs, sort of retrospective accounts to contemporaneous accounts within diaries and letters, I think the main change is, is what soldiers experience and the way that they react to those experiences of, of combat uh, in the 1810s. Uh, and then in the uh, 1860s, early 70s. If, if, I, if I may, I, I would like to, to come back on the uh, strategic and tactical uh, culture of uh, officers. I, I don't know if, if I may, uh, Armel. Yeah, yeah, please, please. Uh, yeah. Uh, you, you are, it's very important uh, to take into account um, the experiences of foreign expeditions of a generation of officers in France. Uh, for example, General Ducot or uh, Colonel Charles Ardent du Pic, uh, or were in, um, in the foreign expedition uh, in the Ottoman Empire in Syria uh, at the beginning of the 60s. And they, they have learned. Uh, a lot of lessons, tactical, uh, but we, we have to, to consider the fact that they generation underestimate uh, the aspect of intelligence uh, in continental war and of industrial war. Um, we will remember the fact that the Ecole Supérieure de Guerre uh, which was founded after the defeat in uh, 1876, um, don't consider uh, the economic warfare or industrial aspects as a fundamental matter of formation. It was the same situation for intelligence at the beginning of this uh, Ecole Supérieure de Guerre. So you have a generation of, uh, of uh, officers uh, and generals uh, who underestimate these two fundamental questions of uh, 1870. Thank you very much, Olivier. And uh, we have a last question for you, Mark, again. You are, you are very successful today. Uh, is this John Varney? Funny. Yeah, okay. Uh, the question is, for those who not got it, did the story, sorry, did the stories told by, uh, of soldiers' traumatic experience of the war reach governments at the time? And the British example, that not happening. Um, I think in the Franco-German War, uh, to my knowledge, not. Uh, there was very little, uh, oh, I, I've not read within within government that there was much uh, acknowledgement of this of this type of literature um, and the, the the numbers of letters going back and forth in 90 million during the course of the war uh, well actually just over 100 million if you include the south german state um, means that most of these letters were not were not censored uh, and the the government didn't take much notice of them i think that is in stark contrast to what happens in the first world war um, where uh, there are regular reports of uh, the contents of letters. Uh, letters are opened by officers, but there are also uh, the regular reports on a, on a, uh, on a, in each in each army, um, and and there is constant uh, commentary on grumbling, grumbling on the home front and grumbling uh, on the fighting front, and that that that's quite different, I think, from what happens in the wars of unification. Thank you governments do take notice of the First World War material. Thank you very much, Edin Mark. Um, Michael, uh, it's 3.30. It's time for uh, having a break or a refreshment break. Uh, um, I uh, Michael's had to step out of our mouth, so I'm just going to um, fill in very quickly for him. Um, thank you, everyone, uh, our panelists, uh, and especially to our Mal for wearing two hats, uh, presenting and sharing, which is never a, an easy job. Um, so as I'm, I was saying, we're going to go for a coffee break now, um, but please everyone rejoin us again at uh, 4 p.m.
1600 for the final panel of the day, uh, which is going to be on the impact of the Franco-Prussian War on military thought. So I look forward to seeing um, all of you uh, in about 30 minutes. Thank you. And thank you again to our panelists. Thank you, Mark.